Washington Journal continues. James Smith is the former U.S. ambassador to Saudi Arabia, and he is joining us on this Sunday from Boston. Good morning. Thank you very much for being with us. Steve, it's good to be with you this morning. Let me begin with the piece that uh, Time Magazine wrote this past week, and it begins with really the centerpiece of what we want to talk about. The kingdom at the crossroads, can Saudi Arabia find a middle path? With the death of King Abdullah and a change in the leadership among the, the, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, what is next? Well, I think with the uh, transition of King Salman, you're going to see continuity. And, uh, and that continuity is a continuity in U.S.-Saudi relationship. Uh, it's going to be, I think, a continuity in their vector toward modernization, uh, continuity and the focus on stability in the region, because Saudi Arabia, as you well know, is in the eye of a storm with uh, a crisis all around. But in terms of our relationship with Saudi Arabia, some have called it uh, at an important crossroads. Why? Well, I've, I've heard that term, but the reality of it is that, that our relationship has been pretty consistent since uh, it was first founded in February of 1944 with the meeting between King Abdulaziz and our President Roosevelt. Uh, it's based on much more than, than, than oil. It's uh, based on shared interest in the region. Uh, and, and the Saudis were, were key allies of ours uh, through the Cold War uh, in the support of uh, Mujahideen uh, in Afghanistan uh, and, and continues today with a shared interest in the region. And I suspect the relationship will continue based on those shared interests. Well, let me just read to you a portion of what uh, Karen Howes writes in Time magazine because she says that while the installation of the new leadership trio in Saudi Arabia is intended to send Saudis and their neighbors a clear message of stability and strength, the reality is that the, um, the regular, uh, the, the regime is threatened from all sides and all the faces mounting domestic pressure from both fundamentalists and progressives or the modernists inside that country. Can you explain? Yeah, and Karen is, is a wonderful writer, uh, and, and, and I um, uh, am, am one of her avid readers. What she's really describing is that Saudi Arabia today is faced by an enormous number of challenges, both external and internal. Uh, external, uh, the, uh, their conflict with uh, Iran, uh, to the south uh, in Yemen uh, with the Houthis, uh, supported by Iran, to the north, uh, uh, ISIS, uh, the remnants of Al Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, so Saudi Arabia sees themselves surrounded by threats. Internally, you've got a traditional uh, struggle between the ultra conservatives and the modernizers. And the base of support for the Al Saud regime has always been their relationship with that conservative religious community. So their challenge always is to balance those two. Uh, and, and, and you have to provide support to the base, which is the uh, conservatives, but you also have to be on a path of modernization to balance that. The, the pace of uh, focus on modernization will continue to increase for any number of reasons. Uh, uh, first of all, every uh, young person in Saudi Arabia has uh, multiple iPhones or Blackberries, so for the first time in history, they have access to infra global information, and, and, and that was never true before. Uh, secondly, with the King Abdullah Scholarship Program, you have upwards of 150,000 Saudi students studying abroad, uh, 100,000 here in the United States. You've got a, a generation that is going to university because they've increased their you know, domestic universities from 8 to 32 just in the last uh, uh, 10 to 12 years. So you have now a generation that has access to global information and for those studying abroad access to critical thinking which has really never been a part of their education process. So this pressure uh, for responsiveness of government will continue uh, to weigh on the Saudis, so the, the pressure toward modernization 
uh, is, is likely to continue unabated. Our guest is James Smith. He served as the U.S. ambassador to Saudi Arabia. He is joining us from Boston, now serving as a senior counselor for the Cohen Group. And our phone lines are open at 202-748-8001 for Republicans and 202-748-8000 for Democrats. You can also send us a tweet at C-SPAN WJ. Ambassador Smith, but as you point out, I mean, the, the, if you want to call it the fault lines between, for example, the Sunni and the Shiites, this is nothing new. As you well know, this dates back not only hundreds of years, but well over a thousand years. So how does Saudi Arabia come to terms with that? And, and what is the role of the U.S.? Well, for the Saudis, I think their, their real contribution on the conflict over extremism and, and, and extremists lies in their self-appointed role as the custodian of the two holy mosques. Uh, that the, the Islamic world looks to Saudi Arabia for leadership. For most of the last 40 years, the Saudis have exported uh, their brand of uh, Islam, uh, which is the Salafist agenda, some would call it Wahhabism, which is uh, ultra-conservative, uh, 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 unyielding, uh, uncompromising uh, and in terms of culture and religion. As a political idea, it is a source of stability because Salafism in Saudi Arabia preaches support for the government. This is a part of the, uh, the pact between the Al Sauds and, and, and uh, the, the, uh, Muhammad al uh, Wahhab that goes back to 1744. The problem is when you export uh, this ultra conservative, intolerant brand. Of, of religion, then it morphs into what we see now as extremism. So part of Saudi Arabia, the unintended consequence of Saudi Arabia's investment uh, is the extremist movement, which is both ultra-conservative in terms of culture and religion, but also very aggressive in terms of its political and, and uh, uh, support for undermining a existing governments. Very, very violent. That was not Saudi Arabia's intent. It is the unintended consequence of that investment. So the most important contribution the Saudis will make is in a leadership role in the thought process of Islam to readdress this fundamental issue of what are the values in that religion and the fact that this extremism should not reflect those values. Our guest is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy and went on to earn his master's at Indiana University. He served as U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia during the first four years of the Obama administration. We'll go to Alvin joining us from Haynesville, Louisiana. Good morning to you. Good morning. Alvin, go ahead, please. Good morning, um, people. I'd like to address... I like to, hello, Alvin. We can hear you. Please go ahead with your question. We're gonna to have to move on. Okay. Um, I like to address the bouncer about the people that's building the pipeline over here in uh, Texas and on up north. They, they cut the pipeline off over there in Africa to start a religious war. Then they're gonna make America build electric cars, and a lot of people can invest their money in electric, and we'd be real rich right in the next five years. Okay, I'm, I'm not quite sure if there's a question there. Ambassador Smith, do you want to respond? Well, Steve, I didn't quite understand uh, the question. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, did I infer let, that... He was, let me ask you the larger question about oil prices, which have dropped significantly. And he mentioned he's from Louisiana, so I would suspect that maybe oil is yeah. one of the issues driving his uh, discussion point here. But as we've seen oil prices falling... What impact has that had on the Saudi economy? Well, so far it's going to have, it's had no impact and probably will not have any impact for several years because uh, the Minister of Finance, uh, Ibrahim Al-Asaf, has uh, been very diligent uh, in his approach to uh, 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 building uh, cash reserves. Uh, and Saudi Arabia is one of the largest holders of, of UST bills, so they, they have a pile of cash to be able to ride through for several years 
uh, a decrease in uh, oil prices. I think, though, uh, Alvin's question really had to do with the relationship with U.S. energy and Saudi Arabia energy. And, and if you look at uh, the, the U.S. economy, there has been a, a constant focus over these last uh, six or seven years to I expand U.S. energy so that we're energy independent, some would say actually interdependent. In reality, we import a very small fraction of our oil from Saudi Arabia. Uh, so the, uh, the, the relationship with Saudi Arabia has very little to do with oil that we receive from the kingdom. It is also true that a, a, a large portion of the oil going to our allies in Europe and Asia comes from Saudi Arabia. So it's very important that we are in a position to protect those sea lines of communication that allow for the free access of uh, global energy. I think, though, that the advancement in our own energy infrastructure in this country is very, very important in terms of the global energy market because for decades now we've lived in a system where OPEC defined the price of oil. Uh, both on the upside and the downside. That's not true anymore uh, because with the United States being a large producer, we have no mechanism by which we can control production. That's the market. Uh, so with the U.S. as a, a large producer now, you are seeing more and more that energy prices are going to be defined by a market, not by OPEC, uh, or other producers. Let me ask you about this photograph that was tweeted out by Secretary of State John Kerry as he was en route to Riyadh, including a number of former Secretaries of State, uh, including James Baker from the Bush administration and Condoleezza Rice, also from the George W. Bush administration. What message did this send uh, the Saudi Kingdom, also the fact that the President, who was already in India, changed his plans to attend the services on Tuesday? Well, if you look at the delegation that went to Riyadh to provide condolence uh, for our government for the passing of King Abdullah, first of all, it was very large, about 30 people, but it reflected about five administrations uh, in the U.S. government. It shows a continuity in the relationship, uh, the bilateral relationship between uh, Saudi Arabia and the United States. Uh, and it showed a commitment to continuing that relationship based on our shared interests. Of course, Mrs. Obama drawing some headlines. Uh, she did not wear a headdress, a scarf, as she greeted members of the uh, Saudi leadership. How significant was that? Uh, it reflected a silliness in um, uh, the media. Uh, the, uh, there were two issues, one about her not wearing a scarf, and the other was that uh, men w did not shake her hand as they did the president. Let me take the second one first. In, in that culture, a man would never be so aggressive as to be the one to initiate uh, that contact with a, with a woman. Uh, so uh, the, if, if she offered her hand, certainly some, uh, a man would have, would have uh, shaken it. But uh, uh, it, it, it was not culturally uh, acceptable for a man to initiate that uh, exchange. Uh, what you would see is people nodding, put their hand over their heart uh, as a token of, of respect and welcoming. So that was a non-issue. The scarf is an intriguing one. Uh, and, and the U.S. government uh, position on women who are at the embassy or serving in an official capacity is that they may wear an abaya but do not have to. They may wear a scarf but do not have to. Uh, my wife never covered in the four years that we were there. Uh, when she was with me in an official function or she was representing us in an official uh, function because she was there as an American. When she was out with her uh, girlfriends shopping, she would carry a scarf around her neck but she never covered. So this was a non-issue. 
and, and uh, the First Lady would have been warmly accepted uh, by the community there, not just the individuals at the reception, but my guess is she was very warmly received by the people of Saudi Arabia, and in particular the women of Saudi Arabia. Brian from Schaumburg, Illinois, outside of Chicago. Good morning. Hey, good, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I have a couple quick points. First off, you were talking about the worldwide oil market. Well, reality is the reason why Americans are paying around $2 a gallon for gas now is because of decisions made by the Saudi government. They want to try and drive all these alternative oil sources, the frackers and the Canadian tar sands, out of business because you're not factoring in production costs. It's very cheap for the Saudis to produce their oil. I think it's like 14 bucks a barrel. Oil has to be above $60, $80 a barrel for these producers in the United States or the Canadian tar sands to be economically feasible. And they're doing that to drive those people out of the market. Also, they're, doing, they're driving oil prices down on their own decision to hurt the Iranians and to hurt the Russians. We'll get a response. Thanks for the call, Brian. Ambassador Smith? Yeah, Brian, I've heard that argument. Uh, uh, this happened once before, uh, and the Saudis, uh, 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 at, at our request, cut their production uh, uh, about 2 million uh, barrels a day. The net impact of that was that the Saudis uh, uh, lost uh, customers, uh, uh, they lost revenue at home, and their position this time was, why should we be the only ones to suffer? Uh, the argument about them uh, trying to drive uh, uh, shale oil out of business is interesting, but the reality of it is uh, uh, it would take a very long time uh, to do that. and. Uh, uh, and and I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that the, the Saudis would be effective at doing it. There are going to be uh, some of these um, uh, producers who are heavily leveraged that will suffer in the long term. I think, though, that, that uh, the industry will survive uh, uh, in, in the short term. Uh, but I don't think the Saudis have the capability to, to actually uh, drive the industry out of business. Uh, there has been some discussion which says the Saudis would agree if there was a consortium of countries that would agree to cut production. And this would include Russia and the United States. Um, the challenge here is we don't have a mechanism to control production. Again, it's based on the economy, and the Russians aren't likely to cut production because they desperately uh, need the revenues. So again, we're looking at the, the price of oil being driven by market forces as opposed to uh, intent by any government. It's true that this impacts countries like Iran and Russia much more than it does uh, our government. Uh, I, the, the Saudis, in terms of their foreign policy, have not done that uh, throughout history, uh, except for the oil embargo back in 73. And while they may uh, agree and support the unintended consequences of the negative impact on Iran and Russia, I, I don't necessarily believe that that was uh, the intent of the action. I think the action truly reflects that the world energy, uh, world energy has fundamentally shifted from an environment based on control to one that is more based on market forces. Our guest In is other words, the Saudis oh. can't really do much about it. I just want to remind our radio audience, our guest is Ambassador uh, James Smith, who served as the U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia during the first four years of the Obama administration. He is joining us from Boston, and Venkat is joining us from Sterling, Virginia. Good morning. Welcome to the conversation. Uh, good morning, Ambassador. Uh, my question is that, in my personal opinion, I view Saudi Arabia as a destructive force in the Middle East. Uh, and I'm, my question really is that it has... It got very regressive policy, social policies. Uh, it got a lot of wealth, but doesn't lead the region in social policies, or even it funds a lot of 
uh, you know controversial madrasas around the world it has funded the isis militants to fight against syria uh, and uh, who which is supported by iran so why is the us so tolerant towards saudi arabia it's is it only because of the peace with israel and uh, oil market or is there, there there is nothing in common between these two our two countries thank you venkat we'll get a response it has been written that in the us saudi relationship uh, we have shared interests but not shared values. And while I don't agree completely with that assessment, there is some truth to it. Uh, it I, for one, wish the Saudis uh, were more proactive in their foreign policy uh, and, and in a positive way. Uh, having said that, they feel the government very much feels in, encumbered by its relationship with the ultra-conservatives in Saudi Arabia and that limits their ability uh, to be proactive. Uh, I, I, I don't necessarily see the Saudis as a destructive force in the same way that you. Uh, I, there, there is no uh, funding by the Saudis of ISIS. Uh, that is a, a, a misnomer. Uh, and in fact, in my very close connections with them uh, in the lead up to Syria, which started April, May of uh, uh, 2011, there was a keen focus on the part of the Saudis to make sure that money and weapons did not go to al-Nusra uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq that moved into Syria and, and morphed as ISIS. Uh, and, and after uh, the global jihadists uh, under Osama bin Laden attacked the Saudis because that was actually their ultimate goal, the, uh, the government, uh, and, and attacking the United States was a waypoint toward that. Uh, the Saudis realized that their funding uh, was going to extremist organizations and, and, and internally they made a series of significant moves to undermine support for extremism. Uh, the zakat was no longer allowed to be given uh, at the individual's uh, uh, desire. Uh, so there was a, 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 a focus on uh, funding both from the government and by individuals to make sure that that money did not go to uh, extremist or terrorist organizations. That's been in the last decade. Uh, their, their attention uh, to the Muslim Brotherhood, other extremist organizations uh, has, has shifted and I think our governments are very much aligned now on uh, the, their support for moderate elements in Syria and support for the counter ISIS campaign in Iraq. Uh, again, having said that, uh, the one issue that uh, we would hope to see more proactive leadership is uh, in undermining support for extremism. Now, again, they've done a, a very successful job of countering export for extremism inside of Saudi Arabia. Now the question is, how do you extend that beyond their borders? King Abdullah started an initiative for this uh, in terms of the religious dialogue, uh, first in Vienna, setting up the religious dialogue center in uh, uh, Vienna. Uh, he called the, the head of Muslim majority countries together during Ramadan in 2012 to address the issue of why are Muslims killing Muslims. We've heard very recently uh, support by others toward the same objective. Uh, uh, President Sisi in Egypt about a week ago, and then a couple of days ago, King Abdullah II of Jordan. So we're, we're, we're seeing the governments of the region start to stand up and say the, the Islamic community at home has got to address this uh, as well. So that's where I would hope that you would see energy on the part of this new government focused. Ambassador Smith, you mentioned Syria, and this morning Jonathan Tepperman, who is the managing editor of Foreign Affairs, with an extensive interview with uh, Syrian President Assad in the Washington Post. It's this, I met Assad, he's too delusional to make peace. 
The essay is also available online at WashingtonPost.com, and the interview is available at the Foreign Affairs website. Let's go to Barbara next in Royal Oak, Michigan, outside of Detroit. Democrats line, good morning. Thank you for waiting, Barbara. Oh, oh, good morning, good morning. My question is a little bit different. Okay. I hope he can answer it. I'm off the oil and what have you, but, and I'm very serious, is Saudi Arabia TV showing all these beheadings or are they too busy beating up on people? What I would like to show is our media showing nothing on that except to quit calling them terrorists and start calling them what they are, cowards and baby killers. Barbara, thanks for the call. Ambassador Smith. Yeah, Barbara, I think we have two different issues uh, that you've addressed as, uh, as the beheadings in Saudi Arabia and then what are we calling the uh, extremists outside of Saudi Arabia, if I uh, uh, get you correctly. The uh, capital punishment uh, practices in Saudi Arabia has always been a source of friction between our governments. Uh, uh, the Saudis, uh, because they base their constitution is the Quran, uh, they base their punishment system on what is written in the Quran. Uh, our view is that is akin to uh, our judicial uh, uh, system and punishments being based on Leviticus. And even though it's written there, we do not behead or stone people anymore. Uh, so we, we are often at odds uh, uh, between our two governments over this practice. The, the problem we have, Barbara, is that on many issues like this one, uh, the argument on our part has to be based on some moral authority. And the, the challenge that we have in addressing the issue of beheadings uh, comes, uh, presents a challenge for us because of our own policy of capital punishment. Uh, the issue of arrests in Saudi Arabia, uh, we have a challenge with that because of our own incarceration rates here in this country. So while it's a different form of capital punishment, uh, both of our governments are involved in that. Uh, the, uh, on, on the issue of uh, uh, the extremists, I, there is a movement now to uh, change the uh, nomenclature. Uh, that uh, not everybody is a terrorist. If you look at ISIS, you're really looking at uh, uh, rogue bands of murderers. Uh, and, and the central focus, as best as most of us can determine, is that you have young men who just enjoy the killing. And, and, and this is a much different than calling them terrorists. From Humble, Texas, on the Republican line, Tom is next. Good morning with Ambassador Smith, who's joining us from Boston. Hello? Good morning, Thomas. Oh, yeah. I'm not Republican. I'm independent. Hey, listen. On Benghazi, is that a witch hunt? And as far as Saudi Arabia, they can build their own navy. I mean, they're building motels. Let them build their own navy. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Um, well, they do have a navy uh, that operates uh, in the Arabian Gulf and the Red Sea. Uh, the issue on the navy is uh, uh, much more strategic than uh, one of our navy doing what their navy uh, should do. Uh, our Navy is the only Navy in the world that can guarantee freedom of navigation in international waters. Uh, that is a global responsibility that our nation and our Navy has undertaken for well over a hundred years. So if you look at the Straits of Hormuz, uh, it is very important to our government and our Navy that no one closes the Straits of Hormuz, not just because of oil coming from the region, but if they're closed, then you've established a precedent uh, which would allow the Straits of Malacca to be closed, uh, and it undermines our responsibility in guaranteeing freedom of navigation in inter international waters. So the presence of our Navy in the Arabian Gulf uh, transcends uh, the issue of doing the Saudi Navy's job for it. Uh, the Saudi Navy is very much in the business of protecting 
uh, Saudi's interest vis-a-vis -vis Iran uh, to the east. Uh, the, the U.S. Navy's responsibility goes well beyond that. The, the caller also Benghazi asked about Benghazi, is, uh, yes. Yeah. Benghazi is a, uh, a much more complex issue, and I come at that from the point of view who someone was in place that weekend uh, when the attack on Benghazi took place. I'm, I'm much more comfortable talking from the perspective of someone was there as opposed to someone who was back here in Washington. Uh, but at the time, we saw the same information, intelligence, if you will, that Susan Rice expressed uh, at the, the Sunday talk shows. Uh, we were dealing with an information set that said uh, there had been uh, 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 riots in Cairo uh, because of the movie, if you remember, uh, that was uh, defaming Islam and the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and we saw these riots in Egypt. And, and therefore, when Benghazi hit, we saw this in the context of what we'd seen in Egypt two days before. Uh, I remember as the ambassador, I pulled the country team together, and we did a very careful analysis of the information that we were receiving, our relationship with the host minister of interior, and felt very comfortable that we knew all the potential threats, and we were very comfortable with our host government and the information they were providing. Nonetheless, we pulled in ever so slightly so as to give a chance for this to blow over. It took some days after Benghazi for us to realize that, no, it was not a riot that then became a, a terrorist event. It was actually a terrorist event from the very beginning. Uh, I, I, at the time, did not believe that there was any possibility of calling a reactionary force to respond to that. Uh, and indeed, the ambassador of any country is placed in the position where he or she must make decisions on the protection of, of U.S. employees, government employees, and by extension, Americans in that country. Uh, we in Saudi Arabia were very comfortable with the information we were receiving. We were very comfortable with our relationship with the host government security forces. And, and because of that, we would move out into the countryside. If we had any question about either of those, we would definitely come in. Your, your physical position is based on your comfort with the information and who's giving you that information. Unfortunately, in Benghazi, there was no Ministry of Interior. There was no host government agency providing intelligence. And there was known conflict between the warring tribes uh, in Benghazi. Uh, so f for those of us who were dealing with it, there was great question on our part of why the ambassador would have put him and other Americans in a position where they did not know the context of what was going on and were in no position to react to it. Unfortunately, the ambassador, who is an extremely capable individual, uh, we're not in a position to question what his motivation was. Uh, but, but again, the single person in any country who has that responsibility is the ambassador himself or herself. We have about five minutes left with our guest, uh, former Ambassador James Smith, who served in Saudi Arabia. We'll go to America's Georgia. Sandra is on the phone. Good morning. Hello, C-SPAN, and good morning, America. Good morning, Sandra. I'm calling from South... Yes, thank you so much. I'm calling from South Georgia, and I want to say that the year I graduated from high school, 1975, that gas was 44 cents a gallon. And if my uh, memory serves me right, after the <laughs> Iran uh, hostage situation, we saw the gas prices suddenly start to skyrocket. So I want to know how can we reconcile 
the fact that in 1975, gas was about 44 cents a gallon till just a few months ago. It was almost 4 to $5 a gallon. How can we reconcile that big jump? Sandra, OPEC was in charge. Sure. Yes. Thank, uh -huh. you, thank you for the call. We just have a minute or two left. We'll get a response from Ambassador Smith. Thank you. Sandra, it's good to hear from you, and my mother went to university in America, so uh, it's, it's great to be talking to someone from back home. Uh, most people would say that back in the early 70s, uh, oil prices uh, were well below the, the value uh, of oil, and that they were held down uh, uh, at uh, uh, an unreasonable rate. It's also reasonable to assume that the cost of producing oil has gone up significantly uh, because in the early years uh, the means of extraction uh, uh, are much different and much less complicated than it is today. It, it wasn't the Iran hostage situation in 1979 uh, and oh by the way the takeover of the Holy Mosque in Mecca uh, that same month November of 1979 that drove prices up. It was the two uh, oil embargoes, uh, first in 1973 and then later I think in 1978 that drove prices up. But they came back down. It's been over the last 30 years that they've crept up and then we saw a spike uh, after 2011 because of the crisis in the region uh, which uh, threaten oil production in Saudi Arabia, in Libya, in Iraq, and Iran. Uh, so I, I would say that those, in addition to uh, the, the uh, natural increase in prices, uh, because uh, everything's gone up in price over that time, accounts for uh, uh, the, the increase in price. The, the con community at large, including the Saudis, would say the natural price for a barrel of oil is somewhere between $75 and $95 a barrel. In a half a minute, what one thing do we need to know about the new uh, king of Saudi Arabia, King Salman? He, uh, uh, King Salman has uh, shown a great capacity for administrative work. He was the governor of Riyadh for nearly 50 years. We have a very close relationship with him, uh, uh, every ambassador going back that time in our government. He's a very hardworking individual. He seems to have surrounded himself with uh, 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 experts in their bureaucracy. Uh, we would expect a continued focus on uh, modernization within the kingdom and hopefully we get a positive balance between this issue of stability versus modernization, more in the direction of modernization. Ambassador Smith, who represented the U.S. in Saudi Arabia during the first four years of the Obama administration, joining us from Boston on this Sunday. Thank you for being with us here on C-SPAN. Steve, it's good to be with you. Thank you.